good afternoon good afternoon everybody and welcome to all the youngsters out there watching this afternoons Friday afternoons kids drive hello hello everybody my name is Steve I'm joined by Cameron on camera and we are out in about on what is a relatively warm afternoon but it's not too bad I must say and uh, well, we're enjoying a moment with a little tree squirrel and he sits up in the tree here and just surveys the land now kids please do ask your parents to send us two questions use the YouTube chat stream or you can send them to us on Twitter we'd love to hear from you this afternoon now the noise you can hear off to the left is a virtual starling making lots of noise and uh, this little squirrel was here when we first arrived and he moved away and I parked the car and I switched off and I hoped he would come back and he has so we are seven species of uh, squirrel in southern Africa five of them are tree dwelling and two are on the ground They're all rodents and they're all active during the day. And this one right here, the tree squirrel, is the most common of the lot. Hello, Sonia. Good day, all animal lovers. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to everybody. If you've been at school all week, or I think it's still school holidays in South Africa for some people, if you've been at school, wishing you a happy weekend. If you have not been at school, well, wishing you a continued holiday. If you've been at work, wishing you a magical weekend. It's been a bit of a difficult day for us this side, so do to apologize for the mood we are pulling ourselves towards ourselves but there is an undercurrent of sadness Deborah they've got very sharp claws and long toes on their feet which enable them to do so I think the best way actually is for me to show you a wonderful photograph in this book of the squirrel's foot. Now let me see if I can get that for you there. Look at this. Look at that foot over there. Now that is how they climb. That is the back foot. And they've got two front feet which look similar. They're just not as long. They've got very long claws. Very strange looking foot, isn't it? Mm, it's a scary looking foot with all those toes. Five toes. So they can actually hang upside down in the tree as well. You don't always see that extra toe that that thumb like toe um, in the track when you find a squirrel track but um, it's more elevated up sort of on the wrist so that's how they do it they're able to climb a very very well they're very busy little creatures very very busy little creatures uh, but sometimes they take it very easy and they sit quietly like this so that we can see them which is very nice hello Ava 10 years old well they don't even get up to 300 grams so I think the heaviest tree squirrel is about 260 270 grams which is very very small it's not even 20 centimeters in length so it's very small so for me, it's two of my hands. No, my whole hand. Yeah, my whole hand is about 20 centimeters. And then add on the tail, about another 15 centimeters. The tail is quite long. Well, I can hear a squirrel shouting off to the left. Chick, 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 chick.
So they'll have a little burrow probably inside this marula tree, a little hollow that's been burrowed out where they will live. Small little family of them. And they have a wide variety of food that they feed on. Okay, well it is a nice warm day here in Juma, but uh, let's go see what the weather has to say. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome, welcome back to another Sunset Safari and you are with us live here at Amakala Private Game Reserve with myself Eric and Morgan behind the camera. This afternoon we're going to be your eyes and ears on a beautiful, beautiful Friday afternoon. Have a look see at our environment. Let me just set the scene for you. It is a little bit breezy as it usually is in Amakala. Actually, normally at this time of the day it's actually quite windy. But I'll touch wood there. We don't want it to be too windy. It is lovely and warm when we sit still. However, there is a chill factor in the air. So as soon as we start moving through the air in the closed, well, not the closed vehicle, in an open vehicle, it does get a bit breezy and cold. But if you're sitting still on a nice patch of grass in the sun, you can actually heat up quite a bit. And this is definitely a autumn wintry day. This is typical typical behavior look how lovely and green it is as well I can definitely see that we've had a fair bit of rain here Mo we have specialized lawn mowers that uh, we employ and they come and they cut our grass these are this is also in the form of animals we have big animals small animals different types of lawnmower types the bigger ones the buffalo do a fair amount of 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 uh, grazing here so they do keep the the soil, or well not the soil, they keep the grass at a decent height, as well as some other antelope, some warthogs as well. Let's not forget about the warthogs. The warthogs are also different a type of lawn mower. But yes, most of the animals keep the grass nice and short, but also, funnily enough, the sun. Before, before we had the rain, we had quite a bit of hot temperatures and the hot temperatures obviously didn't do very well for the grass and it actually killed some of the grass and it wasn't able to get to its acquired growth length We've got a couple of birds making some noises for us this afternoon. Off the bat, we've got the pied crow in the distance. And he's making a fair amount of noise. We've got our sombre green bull also making a decent amount of noise. Not too much. Had to really, really listen out for him. And then our ever-present... Uh, southern bobo one of my favorite birds to make noises the southern bobo they have maybe too many different types of calls that they use on a daily sometimes they will use in uh, you within five minutes now you'll hear maybe three or four different variations of their call I 
that pied crow is making an awful lot of noise. Sounds like he's very, very unhappy. Bella? Um, I'm not actually... Gwen, do you think you could repeat that question? I didn't quite get the full question. And if you look over there, you can see there is one of our elephant bulls that we were looking for this morning. The smallest animal in the bush. Um, it would have to be maybe a field mouse or uh, uh, one of the birds. Um, hmm. Um, I definitely say definitely one of the birds. The stone chat, uh, the nediki, those are all very, very, very small birds. Um, but then also get then also we also get the the termites and the ants and all sorts. But those are all insects. So if we're talking about animals, it would probably have to be one of those birds. So yesterday, in the afternoon, we saw this bull elephant and we knew he was in the area we actually had a little look for him this morning and we clearly didn't look hard enough as he is still here and uh, he's made it his home funnily enough this is also one of the a brothers um the other a brother is the older one his name is Afstat. some of you may know him um he also got into a bit of a fight with our big bull and since then he's not been banished but he's sort of stuck to one area of the reserve um, of recent times where not that the herd doesn't go there it's just that they're not there as frequently and uh, this bull over here has also isolated himself away from the herd very interesting in a area where they pretty much never never come so now he has this whole area all to himself with the three amigos and the herd of buffalo i think welcome back well we just had to reposition because uh, we had a whole herd of impala coming down and they're across the damn wall and around the back and here they are we were wondering where all the impala were today and well, we found them all being herded by that male in the middle and a few ladies have just run behind us and he's looking over going ah oh, should i go catch them or should i just keep herding these ones See how much bigger he is. Hey, but where we are now in Juma, I'd probably say that this animal here, the impala, is the fastest. But um, gazelle, springbok, very, very fast. But they reckon the topi or the tesapi is the fastest. Uh, I haven't seen any in this area, although they probably used to occur here. We do find them in the Kruger, the tesapi. And they're on their way back up. 
into the open area there. They must have had a drink because they all came straight past the dam and no one drank. So they must have been drinking already on the other side. And they decided now the grass is greener on the other side. Momo, it's difficult with, with many of them, you know, the, there's some youngsters in there, you can see there's a young male there just in the middle, moving to the left, he's got very small little paw, little horns, he was born in November, uh, and when you see other little ones that don't have horns, they are young females that were born in November, but then for the rest of the females, it's very difficult to say, because after two years, they look fully grown, and then you don't know, they all look very similar. Um, the males go through one year, two year, three year horn development and then after the fourth year it becomes difficult to know. So all of the, the boys that were born November before last, they've been pushed off and you can actually recognize them when you see them. All the boys are hanging out together. And then you can maybe tell the two year old boys and then after that it becomes a bit tricky. It becomes a bit tricky. You can see how they bunch together like that. Very well established herd mentality. Safety in numbers. They all want to be in the middle of that group. No one wants to be sort of on the edge. No one really wants to be the first one to walk. But staying together is a good safety strategy. Very good question, Jesse. 11 years old. Well, those birds sitting on the impalas are catching a ride. And while they're catching a ride, they've also got a meal. I'm busy plucking ticks and combing ticks out of the impala's fur. That's right, ticks. Blood-sucking insects that are growing on the impala's bodies. Ugh. They bite them. They clean them off the impala. Actually, beneficial for the impala and for many other animals that we have. To clean the ticks because out here in these long grass environments there are lots of ticks and the ticks are parasites ticks have the potential to transfer disease and uh, having high tick loads can not only be irritating but can actually lead to an animal losing condition and once an animal loses condition they're not fit and they normally get picked off by predators quite easily so it's important to stay strong to stay fit and to remove the ticks. And impalas remove a lot of their own ticks as well. They actually are able to comb and groom themselves. But the oxpeckers play a very important role as well on impala and many other and too. Okay, well our impala are disappearing up the hill. We're going to reposition and see what else we can find for you this afternoon. Very bright, Cam. Can you turn the lights down a little? All right, I forget we're not in the tent. You can't turn the lights down. <laughs> Angle of the sun in our tear laden eyes, hey? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to drive that way. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. And while we head that way, we're going to send you over there to James, who is looking forward to saying good afternoon. Hello, everybody. We are driving to the south under the beautiful African sky. My name is James and on camera is BK Bokomosomolinga who is now wearing a hat that is the color of mustard or custard depending on which you prefer. Most people prefer custard to mustard. I know I do. We're heading down towards the south of the reserve 
and we'll see what we can find in some of the water holes and otherwise we'll just explore around this part of the world I'm sure Steve will head towards where the male lion was near where he is now and maybe we'll get a view of a lion there and if we're very lucky we'll have an elephant or two and maybe if we're very very lucky we'll get a leopard who knows who knows what the afternoon will bring but it's a lovely what we call autumnal afternoon which means the temperature is very delicious it's not very hot where is my jacket just talking about that oh there it is i see it good because it's going to get a little bit chilly as we as the sun sets but not cold and it's just a lovely lovely time to be out the sky is a bright deep blue and everything is just lovely Noah what animals do we see most in the bush well mammal wise remember that animals are everything from termites to elephants out here so the mammal that we see the most are the impala which Steve was showing you and the animal we see that what's that a leopard track Ooh, that's very fancy of you to find BK and uh, the animal we see the most or the most common animal here is probably termites now BK is not only a camera operator he is also apparently a good tracker because he's found a leopard track have I driven over it? Ah, here. <laughs> yeah. That's impressive. That's very impressive. I'm not even going to try and show you this with the camera because it's very difficult to see. I suspect very strongly that this track comes from the leopardess we saw this morning heading towards where that lion was. But it's possible it didn't. And so I think we should definitely take this road and see if it isn't perhaps another leopardess. There was a leopardess called Langa around here not too long ago. Well, not far from here. Yesterday she was uh, not far from here, just south of our little boundary. So maybe Langa has come for a visit up this part of the world. Well spotted, BK. If we find a leopard here, I shall be both ashamed and very happy. <laughs> BK, are there any tracks there? Nothing. There's a little collection of water holes here. So let's drive around there and see if maybe there isn't something there. Hannah, how do I know it belongs to a female? Well, it's because it's pink. Male leopard tracks are green and female leopard tracks are pink. That's not true, Hannah. It's just simply because female leopards are smaller than male leopards, which means that their tracks are smaller. They've got smaller feet. And so it could be a very young male, but I don't think that that's the case. And it could be, it's most likely an adult female. It's a good question, that. We'll just drive very slowly along here. It's not a very old track. Charlotte, I'd love to say that I did know all animal tracks, but no, I don't. I know most of the animal tracks out here, because this is where I live and work, but I don't know all animal tracks. And what's interesting is that, you know, you can know good, good animal tracks, so tracks that have been, that are obvious and clear, but sometimes all you get is just a piece of a track and that's where the real skill comes. Little water hole down here. I don't see any leopard cat waiting there. I also didn't see any more tracks so I do think it was the leopard we had earlier this morning. 
that walked off in that direction, but I could be wrong. Definitely worth checking down here. Nice and slow and careful. Just two more little water holes along here. Wouldn't it be nice to find a spotted kitty lying next to one of these water holes, luxuriating in this gorgeous autumnal sunshine? Not at that one. There's one more around this corner. And then we will be able to decide where to go. I think we'll probably just continue down towards the south. No leopard there. All right, well, it's still nice to come and check along here see what's going on. We'll head back now down towards the south and see if we don't get lucky with something else. And I think you are going to go somewhere else yourselves. Hmm, well you're back live with us and I just wanted to show you Last example of a russet bush willow. Now, why do I want to show you this? You see how this branch was broken, and what happened is the tree then goes and forms these new shoots. Can you see all these shoots are shooting out of this branch here? Yeah? Look how straight they go. So nice and straight. So, this tree in Afrikaans is called a kiri klapper, and a kiri is basically a walking stick. So this is a tree that is perfect for making walking sticks and one of these branches in a year or so would be perfect. I mean there's more of them growing in the tree. You can see some of them there and uh, I actually made one the other day out of exactly a tree like this. Look at this. Look at my wonderful stick that I carved from my own. Now obviously I blessed the tree and I asked the tree's permission. Can I harvest you but it's a nice straight stick with a little bit of a bend on the end what do you think cam you like my stick it's nice and solid just letting it dry a little bit and i'm going to leave it here because i'm going home next week and then i'll come back up and then i'll sand it and i'll oil it and then have it ready for my trail season what i love about it is this little piece over here is where the branch was actually rubbing against another branch for quite a long time and it's given us beautiful beautiful brown coloration nice and smooth nice and smooth nathan there are lots of things we can make out here and they, nature's filled with medicine obviously you know got to be sustainable in things that you harvest and uh you can't just take things from the wilderness you have to be very careful about how you do that but this tree the kiri klapper you can see those wonderful straight branches. Now, if you got an eye infection, or what some people call pink eye or conjunctivitis, I know many kids get it when they're younger. I definitely got it when I was a child. You can take these leaves in hot water and you can boil it and steam it and it'll help to clean the, uh, the conjunctivitis or the pink eye out of your eye. And if you're feeling quite coldy and fluey and a bit head coldy, you can also take these leaves, you can boil them in water, and you can drink it. It'll make you feel so much better. So we're going to carry on down the road and see if we can find something magnificent. But let's head you over to Amakala and see if Eric has found anything.
Oh, that was actually quite an interesting segment there. Thank you, Steve. We will take that into consideration. Oh, my goodness. Not too sure if anyone else heard that, but that was uh, an Impala ratting. Obviously, the two of them are fighting. So we're sitting here, we're not just staring at a bush. Um, supposedly, underneath that bush is the three amigos. Now, we know that the three amigos are next to that bush because we saw them there, but uh, obviously, they are lying flat, still sleepy, and uh, probably still with bellies full of food. Uh, they are definitely going to want to try and sleep that off. The longer they sleep, the more it digests. You know, obviously, if you're not, if you're sleeping, your body is not focusing on keeping you awake and digesting. And if you're sleeping, then it can just focus on the digestion process and uh, can actually speed it up quite a bit. And obviously, they got a little bit too warm and moved off into the shade and the cover of that small little Xerxia Xerxia bush or Xerxia tree and funnily enough that tree is related to the mango tree they are part of the same family however it does not produce any fruit that of the size of a, of a mango nor does it produce any fruit at all but it is an evergreen tree, which means that when it is winter time or autumn time for us, the leaves don't fall off, they stay on. And they will stay green all of its life. Until such time as you get a cheetah male scent marking on it, to which the leaves will go brown. They may also fall off and die. But uh, that doesn't come from just one male cheetah urinating on it. It comes from from all three of these male cheetahs, and uh, they got to do it an awful lot. Nicole, they are very similar color to the grass. Uh, they are that brownish, and the thing is, they've got all these spots. And the spots really, really do help them blend into their surroundings so perfectly. Yeah. I remember, I always used to think, how on earth could something like a, a cheetah or a leopard ever be camouflaged if it's covered in all these spots and in the leopard's case, rosettes? How can, she, how can they ever hide from an animal? Until I saw a cheetah disappear in front of my eyes, less than five meters away. It was, it was on that day that I realized you know, those spots actually do help a lot with the blending in. Even if you're looking at them from afar, um, you know, they don't even have to be lying down. If you're looking at a cheetah that's probably maybe 200 meters away and that's walking along a, a field, um, it's sometimes very difficult to even see them there if they're walking very, very slowly because they, like, they are the same color as uh, brownish grass. And these boys are very, very well camouflaged, but they're also fairly flat, fairly thinnish. And, uh, well, because they're very slender, that can also help them hide in very, very long grass. And this is not very long grass, but it's fairly long grass. Lucas, cheetahs can sleep for, well, they don't generally, they don't sleep uh, or go into a deep sleep. They more nap than anything else, but they can nap um, for two hours. They can nap for six hours. They can nap even up to 12 hours um, they they take little little naps all over obviously being a very very dainty delicate animal there are threats 
that they have to deal with on a daily basis and that could well be lions it could be spotted hyena um, even brown hyena I've seen a, a brown hyena mob of a female cheetah once but that was also for a, a, an impala that she had just killed brown hyena was hungry and clearly much hungrier than the female but yeah, you know, for the most part yeah, they will nap rather so that they can some of them can keep a watch out for predators uh, we are going to have some visitors in a bit we've been sitting here all by ourselves we've had the sighting but we are going to have some visitors in a bit Did you hear the question? Are cheetah spots the same in each family? Emily, they vary. They do vary. You know, each cheetah does have their unique, uh, unique spots. Now, obviously, I've admired our three boys quite substantially over the last, I think it's almost coming up for a year and a half that they've been on Amakala. And uh, there's obviously two brothers, two biological brothers and one non-biological brother. And the two biological brothers, you can see that their facial features are pretty much the same. However, the spots on the tail are different. So if the spots and the stripes on the tail are a little bit different, then it's very possible that they will have, might have a few more spots than the other one does. But generally speaking, they'll have about 2,000 spots on their bodies uh, in all different places. Um, <clears throat> obviously, some of them might not be in the same, but they might in the same spot, but they may have very similar groupings of spots on each other. <laughs> As you can hear, we've been joined by another tour group. They are on their afternoon safari, just like we are. have not had any movement of these boys they are they really are just wanting to relax and digest whatever it is in their stomach you know i'm pretty sure they'll feel a lot happier when they know that they can hit their their personal best speeds at the moment with the big belly well we don't know how big their bellies are but uh, i'm assuming there's still a decent amount of food in their bellies they are at a stage where they can't run as fast as they would like to David, amazing question, brilliant question. Yes, they are born with their spots. However, they look a little bit different when they're born. They, uh, if you know what a honey badger looks like, a honey badger is black and then it's got a little white on the top, almost looks like it's been walking in the snow and the snow has fallen on top of its back. That's what baby cheetahs look like. So they look like little honey badgers. And the reason for that is so that when other prey Sorry, we're not prey. When other predators see them, they think, ooh, those aren't baby cheetahs. Those are honey badgers. So maybe let's just leave the honey badgers alone because, well, honey badgers are not animals you want to play games with at all. They are ferocious creatures that will latch onto your shoe, that will latch onto you, that will latch onto pretty much anything, your car tire, if they could, and they will not let go. So yeah, honey badgers are quite ferocious creatures and um, 
if uh, the baby cheetahs look like honey badgers, their length of survival is actually a lot better. But they are covered. They are covered in spots. Just a little bit smaller, not as easier to see. actual fact someone else found him and we joined them here and this male lion might look dead but he isn't he's been asleep since we found him or left him here about poof, when did we leave him at about seven o'clock this morning so he's been fast asleep here now for oh look at his head it's up hello lazy bones for nine hours, he's just been lying there. Doing nothing, except probably rolling over once or twice. Hitting the flies away and licking his own feet. BK, I'm quite glad I don't have to lick my own feet. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't, even if I wanted to, I don't think I could reach. my hands I suppose <laughs> so we'll sit with him for a little while and see what he does he's a young male I've forgotten exactly how old he is I'm sure someone will tell us fairly soon <laughs> uh, Enzo you say cool hairstyle or oh, a lion cool hairstyle Enzo I don't think he's got a cool hairstyle I think his hairstyle is going to improve though unlike me I've lost my hair and it's never coming back he's just getting his And that's nice for him. I'm very jealous. We'll see how long he stays in this area. I suspect quite strongly that he might move off fairly soon because he's what we call a nomad which means that he doesn't have a territory of his own. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you see, I'm glad that I didn't try and guess his age because I would have got it completely wrong. I said, um, I would have said he was much younger than five. Kimberly Lopez says he's five. And the reason that his mane is relatively underdeveloped for a five-year-old is that he lives in an area of very high lion competition which means that his mane is not going to grow out as quickly as a lion on say Amakala where there is much less competition and the manes grow out when they become really dominant and they begin to express dominance and he's just not managed to do that because there's so many other lions around here so you can see he's got quite a heavy mane down below underneath his chin yeah, but not much on top. He has a big foot. And in actual fact, I was surprised when I saw him this morning because his footprints are huge. He's, his footprints look like an enormous male lion. And he is a big male, but he's not by any stretch of the imagination a dominant male yet.
Oh, he's always got an itchy neck. Mmm. I can almost feel his relief. All right, the Vov has managed to find a bird. Let's go across to him. Well, how splendid, a lion. I completely forgot about the lion this afternoon. That's okay, we're doing a little bit of birding. Top of this tree, we've got two non-breeding southern grey-headed sparrows. I don't know if they're fully mature because they really do lack the dark greyish head. But the one on the right, just on the shoulder there, you can see that little white spot on the shoulder, which we call an epaulette, which is quite a characteristic feature of the grey-headed sparrow. They're just chilling, top of the tree, enjoying the view. I think it must be quite a lovely view from up there. Cam, can you tell me about it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you might not know why I'm laughing, kids, because Cameron is incredibly tall. So whenever there's a, a tall story, I always ask Cam if he can enlighten me because, well, he's, he's head and shoulders above most. Gray headed sparrow fairly common bird and they do move around they can occur in normally quite large groups hmm Jaden 10 years old well not all birds can fly but those that can they learn pretty soon after what we call fledging so some birds will occur in a nest in a tree where they'll be born and uh, well, they'll hatch and then once they fledge, meaning once they're ready to leave the nest, that is the day they learn how to fly. So until they leave the nest, they are still bound to the nest and they can hang around the nest and climb up and down the tree. But generally they need to fly away to then show that they're becoming able to fly. So that first jump out of the tree can be quite difficult for them. You can imagine never having used all those muscles before and the feathers haven't really done what they're supposed to do yet. They've just emerged on the body and the bird takes what we call a leap of faith and they fly. Sometimes they don't go very far. Sometimes they don't go up. They go down and land on the ground. But normally, depending on the bird, anywhere from a month to two months after they are hatching. So that's pretty quick, to be honest. Uh, bigger birds will take a bit longer than that. And uh, some birds are on the ground. They don't learn how to fly for a bit longer because, well, they can walk and they run and they hide and they camouflage themselves and mum and dad look after them. But pretty soon, if you think about it, a month or two after hatching, birds are flying. That's very, very quick. Adam is probably a male and a female there. It's probably a, a pair that are hanging out together, telling each other long stories of the summer that has passed and uh, telling themselves about the winter that is about to come. And What stories do you think they're telling themselves up there, Cam? Mm. The one on the left is busy preening and cleaning its feathers. Probably spent a fair bit of the day busy eating. The other one's look on the lookout. The other one is on the lookout because you, when you're sitting on top of a tree like that, you are quite prone to being snatched out of the tree by a very fast moving bird of prey. But uh, these birds have got eyes on the side of their head, so they can actually see danger coming from behind them. Not directly behind, there's a bit of a blind spot. That's why they're turning their head from side to side all the time. But that's how we can tell the difference between birds of prey or predators and prey. 
you have a look where the eyes are and that's right our eyes are on the front aren't they it gives us binocular vision which means we can focus in on something and we can put our attention on it whereas you think about a horse and a cow an elephant their eyes are pretty much on the side of their heads which means they can look quite well behind them not at their bottom but quite well behind them where you and I cannot do that unless we turn around a cat can't do that a dog can't do that they are very forward focused and so when you see an animal have a look where its eyes are situated that will give you a good idea of what it does Okay, and these are the two most accommodating grey-headed sparrows I think I've ever come across in my life. The view must really be quite something up there, because they're just hanging out. Hanging out in this lovely dead knobthorn tree jojo well snakes would monitor lizards especially on the babies and the eggs and then any of our medium-sized birds of prey such as the gabar goshawk or a lizard buzzard maybe a sparrow hawk any fast moving birds of prey like the shikra they would prey on them, most definitely. And then when they're perched in the tree at night, we also have certain cat-like creatures that creep around and feed on birds, such as genets, the African rock python, which is a snake, obviously. If they're on the ground, they're also prone to predation from cats like caracal and serval. And although they probably wouldn't see a leopard take a sparrow, there's nothing to stop a leopard from catching a sparrow. It's probably not on the diet of a lion, but definitely pretty much all of the cats have the potential, apart from maybe the cheetah and the lion catching these birds. But their biggest danger is from the sky. And birds of prey that are hunting from the sky, they come in quickly, like jet fighter planes, falcons. They come in really quickly, and the bird sitting on the tree has absolutely no idea. Okay, thanks, Cap. Tom, eight years old. Well, their nest is done right now. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, ooh, they would have been breeding in the summer. So they're now out of breeding. They're getting ready for a nice long winter. Okay, so let's go check some water points. Let's go see what's happening. I know James said he was going to go check water points. He obviously thought I was going to the lion, but I completely forgot that there was even a lion. It's been one of those days, everybody. We're just putting one foot in front of the other.
Well, we've just got a few more minutes left of our kids' drive, and we're sitting with our male lion, and he's twitched his ears a bit, and he sat up very briefly and then shook his head, and then he went, oh, and went back to sleep. Now, I'm just going to be quiet because there's a lovely sound. Now that's the sound of the bearded woodpecker. And the bearded woodpecker is not just pecking to dig into the wood. That is actually a territorial call. So he's saying to all the other bearded woodpeckers in the area, I am here, I am here. And he finds a special hollow tree that has no internal wood. And there's another one different sound. That's cool. And I'm <laughs> I think they've all got a, sli a unique tone, not tone, but a unique rhythm. I wonder if he's not in that marula tree. Let's see if I can spot him. Oh, and there's a southern black tit calling. Yeah, go to the southern black tit. Because the lion ain't doing nothing. So cool. The southern black tit is often associated with other birds that have come foraging in the same place. Liam, you say that it's so cool that I know what's making all the sounds. I don't know everything that's making the sounds. But these are two quite common sounds that I know. <laughs> you still got the southern black tip? He's gone. Yeah, it does, Gwen. Gwen says it sounds like somebody hitting a container with water in it. I don't know where he is. It's so loud. I'm sure he's in that marilla tree. But if we go any closer, he'll fly away. Thirty seconds to the end of our kids' drive. I think I've seen him. Hang on. No, I haven't. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. And for those of you who are older than kids, we'll continue the adult show shortly. <laughs>